All right. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, I really like Morocco a lot. My first trip there was in 2017, and I've uh, attempted to go back earlier. Um, I mean, after during the pandemic, but of course, um, the Morocco closed its borders, so I was not able to return um, until um, this spring um, after uh, 2018, and um, planning on another trip in uh, 2024. And uh, it's it's a remarkable place. Like you, when you think of North, when I thought of North Africa, I just thought of desert and very dry, arid areas um, and pretty bleak. But uh, it's uh, it's quite different than than my expectations um, when I when I arrive there pleasantly. And so I will um, uh, go over the kind of the whirlwind tour of all the major areas, all the best burning sites, and the real diversity of habitats. Um, this is my, uh, my photo galleries are at this website, sterlingbirds.smugmug.com. And I have uh, many, many photo galleries from all over the world. And uh, my Morocco photos are there. I have far more Morocco photos on that site than I'll be given on my, in my presentation. And if you need to get a hold of me, it's jsterling at wavecable.com. Um, I do send out, I do have a list, uh, email list where uh, I send out uh, notices about tours or field trips um, or uh, local field trips or uh, classes, burning classes. And uh, so well, let's get started. Here's kind of an overview of the region. Um, it's sort of a narrow strip along the, the coast there, south of, of the Straits of Gibraltar. and um, Portugal and Spain in the north, and then the interior, and then the east is Algeria, and Algeria and Morocco are not on friendly terms. Um, they have a rivalry, and um, south of that red line there is uh, um, Western Sahara, which is um, been annexed by Morocco and administered by Morocco, and it hasn't been officially accepted by the UN and, and, and the entire international world as Morocco, but um, for uh, in, oh, it's basically run by Morocco now. So, and it's an interesting area. So this is sort of the triangular um, route that we take. Um, so we do cover a lot of ground and the Southeast is the Saharan desert and um, in the north, we get into um, more of a similar to uh, kind of a Spanish and Portuguese type habitats, uh, coastal lagoons, cork oak forest, um, a lot of agriculture, a lot of wheat is grown there. And then further south is the um, um, high Atlas Mountains. And then along the coast in the south, in the southwest there in that corner is a kind of a um, wonderful dune system, uh, world famous for wildflowers in March and April, and um, also you know, a little bit arid as well, but um, we'll be showing you photos of everything. So that's sort of the general route. It's um, a lot of driving in between spots, but we take um, about 15, 16 days to do it. Um, so we, we do cover a lot of ground. And we usually start in, in Marrakesh. And this is a, um, there's these little hotels in the old town, the old uh, Medina of Marrakesh. It's an ancient city. And um, a lot of these uh, hotels were uh, rebuilt. Um, there were old um, houses of wealthy people and they were repurposed as uh, boutique hotels and full of um, art and, uh, exceptional craftsmanship. And this is the, the rooftop where we sit and drink the famous Moroccan mint tea and eat croissants. Um, the first colonial colonials uh, in Morocco were uh, Spanish and then they were um, taken over by the French. So the French have had a, have had a pretty strong impact on Morocco in terms of some of the food and French is spoken wide, uh, widely there. The three main languages in Morocco are French, Berber, which is the indigenous group, 
and Arabic. And the Arabs invaded, um, it was about 800 years ago or so, something like that. It kind of took over a lot of the areas, but um, uh, the Berbers are a little bit further south um, and uh, um, are, um, a lot of them are nomadic in the, in the Atlas Mountains and in the, in the Sahara. So from the rooftop, we could see the little house buntings come to the roof and walk around. I'll show you some photos of them. Um, it's a great for watching uh, raptors fly over during migration, uh, booted eagles and short coat snake eagles. Um, uh, white, white storks are nesting from this rooftop. Uh, we could see probably a dozen uh, nests of white storks on the towers and tops of buildings. Was pretty neat and there's lots of swifts that are flying around as well and you know you get a list of maybe 15 species of birds just from the rooftop so it's a good introduction and um just south of of marrakesh um well we usually start with a um a cultural tour of marrakesh the first day just to get our feet wet and get over jet lag etc so um we don't really do much birding the first day and then um, the second day, we drive south about an hour to the High Atlas Mountains, and they're huge. And we get up to the snow line, up um, 10,000 feet. The highest peaks, I believe, are about 14,000 feet. And this is actually a ski resort um, where we go to because we can drive right up to the top um, and look for a lot of really special birds that are found in this alpine area. It gets a little bit cold there, and this was in March. Um, and one of the birds we see is the alpine chuff, which are found in the Himalayas, across the high, the Caucasus Mountains to the Alps and the Pyrenees, and down into the High Atlas Mountains. So um, definitely a high elevation species. It's very um, small populations in, in these isolated mountain ranges. Um, it's a it's in the crow family J family and they have those short little yellow bills and also up there are red bill chuffs which are longer uh, bills and they're red and um, they're also in fairly large numbers at this elevation uh, one of the really fancy birds that we come up here to see is the african crimson winged finch and it's only known from the highest peaks in the Atlas Mountains in uh, Morocco and a few little isolated mountains in Algeria. And uh, it's equivalent to um, the rosy finch. They're up in the snow and um, they, they look like a rosy finch. They have the, the rose colored um, uh, wings and a very similar shape, a little bit bigger than our rosy finches, but very similar ecologically. So it's, it's a really special bird. Another bird is the Atlas hornlark. It's the same species that we have in North America. Back in North America, we only have, in the, the whole Western Hemisphere, we only have one lark species. But if you go to um, Africa and Southern um, Europe, there are lots and lots of species of larks. Uh, even the, there's a few in Asia too, and, um, uh, but fewer, but most of the larks are in Africa. And on this trip, we see 14 or 15 species of larks. Um, but these birds nest, the Atlas horn larks nest only in the highest elevation, um, just like the horn larks in um, California in the Sierra Nevada. And this subspecies is only restricted to these mountains. Another really cool bird is a black red start. And the red starts in the, in the old world are not related to our red starts in the new, in the new world. Um, our red starts are warblers. The red starts there are related to the, the thrushes. And this is the black one. And um, they have lots of buntings too. And their buntings in the old world are different from our buntings. In fact, their buntings are more related to, um, uh, not exactly, but more closely related to long spurs. Um, and our buntings are... Uh, are very, very different. So uh, this is the rock bunting <laughs> um, found up in these high elevations. 
and the rock Petronia, and the Petronias are related to house sparrows. And this is a fancy bird only found in these high mountains. Um, they get them in the forests, some old growth forests, but most often see um, up in the alpine area. And weed ears, there's lots of weed ears. We have one weed ear species in North America. It's restricted to uh, Greenland and um, Northwestern um, Alaska. And in Africa, there's lots and lots of weed ears. We, we get, I think, seven or eight species of weed ears in Morocco. And this is the black one. It's kind of a dull black with that white undertail. And they're, they're in these high elevation rocky areas in the alpine area and they're also on coastal cliffs in the rocks down in low elevation and this is a really special bird this is the sea bombs weed ear which has recently been split from the northern weed ear it's very different it has a black the male has a black throat and uh, they're only found in the atlas mountains in the tops of the atlas mountains and that's it in this high elevation above tree line zone and they um, uh, winter in um, the Sahel, which is the area just south of the Sahara. And here's the, the foothills. And I uh, see this nice nice river coming through. This, this was taken in uh, early April when the uh, leaves haven't um, fully come out yet on these poplar trees. And you can see the, the high elevations in the background. Very beautiful place. There's lovely hotels and restaurants in, in some of these canyons. Um, very popular with tourists and uh, with local tourists and also Europeans and the occasional American. And uh, these are really good birding areas as well. This is one of the hotels that um, we have stayed at in the past. Um, beautiful place. And um, the terrain is looks very similar to Utah or the eastern, uh, the Great Basin area of California, Nevada, um, a lot of pinion, or looks like pinion pine, but it's not, and a lot of juniper, um, sort of semi-arid. And this is a little oasis, and uh, we got lots of really cool birds in, around these gardens, including the Lavalence woodpecker, which is endemic to Morocco and a few areas in Algeria. And it's related to the green woodpecker of Europe. And um, it's almost it's almost flicker size and just a really gorgeous bird, a very special. And another endemic to the region is the African blue tit, which is one of my favorite birds down there. It's a little bit related to the the blue tit of Europe, but it's um, a lot of black on the face and uh, very different. Um, and tits are uh, chickadees. That's what the the old world um calls chickadees tits and we call tits chickadees and here uh, but they're this they're basically the same thing and there are wagtails this is a gray wagtail wag, gray wagtails nest along rivers so you often see them on rocks in the middle of these creeks and rivers And the African chaffinch, which is some people we still regard it as a subspecies of the European chaffinch, um, but it's, it's very different. It's got a pink chest and uh, green back, and it's, it's, it's a very different bird. And this is endemic to the region up in the forest and areas. Um, and in the foothills, we get the surtle buntings, which are uh, relate to similar to the rock bunting that I showed earlier, but much more colorful and uh, found in the shrubberies, shrubbery areas. And, and then the European siren, which is similar to a siskin, um, closely related. Um, this is very yellowish bird. Uh, it's about the size of a siskin, maybe a little bit smaller, and about, no, about the same size, similar habitats. And uh, these are common in the foothills as well. And then the great spotted woodpecker. This is the Atlas Mountain subspecies, which is endemic to the region. And uh, pretty common. And 
we get Western Benelli's warbler, which the old world warblers are very different from ours. They're very drab, not colorful at all. And uh, this is one of the special species that's uh, found in, gets up into um, Southern Western Europe and um, also nests in the Morocco, Algeria area. And Barbary partridge. If you've seen chuckers, whoops, chuckers in California, their chuckers are um, introduced from um, Asia and the Middle East. And they're very closely related to the Barbary partridges. And these are endemic to this region as well. And a very special bird is the Maghreb tawny owl. And this is recently split from the tawny owl species that's widespread in Europe into Asia, Northern Asia. And this is um, an endemic only found in Morocco and I think they're in Tunisia and Algeria as well. Uh, but it's a big owl, similar to a size to a barred owl or a spotted owl. And we get, I took, took this photo right next to the hotel that I showed the photo of. Uh, it's a pretty special bird. They're, they have a very different call from the tawny owl of Europe and they have a little bit different um, under pattern, patterns on the underparts as well. These nice little crosses, dark crosses. Uh, it's a neat bird. And then after spending a day or two in the Atlas Mountains, we um, drive back across towards Marrakesh along the plains. And um, we go, we stop at the spot. It doesn't look like much. It's a bunch of rocks, just a bare area. But it is loaded with some really special birds. Often see booted eagle flying over. And booted eagles look very similar to Swainson's hawks. You can see that underwing pattern in the, in the dark primaries. It's a very similar bird, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit larger than the Swainson's hawk, but, but very, very similar. It's a common migrant to the area. And a special bird that a lot of Europeans come down to see, and it's like it's on the it's on the cover of the of the bird books for Morocco is the Moussier's red start. This is a, a male. And this is out in this dry, scrubby area in the plains, this rocky desert. Um, beautiful little bird. And um, they have shrikes there, wood chat shrike, with nice red crown and back. And Spanish sparrow. And these are related to house sparrows. Uh, but I see all the black streaking underneath. This is found in um, Spain and Portugal down into. Um, Northern Africa, Northwest Africa. And you, this looks very similar to the loggerhead shrike. This is a Southern gray shrike. It's uh, definitely bigger, bulkier than the, our loggerhead shrike, but very, very similar patterns. And uh, one of the more colorful of the old world warblers is the Sardinian warbler, that bright red eye and the pink legs. Um, these are very common uh, breeders um, in the scrubby areas, semi-desert. And around Marrakesh itself, and even out in the open country, you'll see pallid swifts. And these are very big swifts. They're very similar to the common swift of Europe, but you can see all that, that, that scaling on the, and pale underneath on the under, under parts. Uh, very scaly look, and that's the pallet swift. And they actually nest in the underneath uh, the tiles and the tile roofs of buildings in Marrakesh, in the old town of Marrakesh. And of course, white storks are around. They're a spectacular bird. Uh, you can't get enough of those. They're they're pretty pretty magical. And another some uh, recent split from the old world magpie is the Maghreb magpie. And you can see that blue facial skin behind the eye. And that's a, this is an endemic species to um, Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria. Maghreb refers to the name of the region, the Maghreb region, uh, which is encompasses Morocco and a little bit of Argent, uh, Algeria. 
and uh, notice it's kind of it doesn't have much color in it. it's more black very not very glossy a very very um, blackish bird magpie and here's another weed ear this is a black ear in fact it was recently split from the eastern species which is um east uh breeds east of italy and uh into uh, the middle east and this species the western black ear it is in um i think they're in southern france and um northwest africa <laughs> portugal and spain as well but beautiful birds and a male and they're, they're common in these lowland areas especially in agricultural areas as well um between Marrakesh and Casablanca, there's a lots and lots of agriculture, a lot of wheat, et cetera, grains. And in some of these wheat fields, you get the calandra lark. This is one in, um, you see that black collar and the black underwings. Um, this is a fairly large lark um, and uh, it's doing aerial display. And one of the common birds in this in this area is the crested lark, and there are three species of larks that have crests. But this is one that's found uh, north of the Atlas Mountains in, in sort of the agricultural region, called the crested, and they also get into Spain. And European turtle doves are pretty common. Fancy, fancy, fancy bird. And here's a female, the house bunting that I mentioned earlier, um, on the rooftop of the uh, of the hotel. After that, after uh, Marrakesh area, the plains, we go north into the north coastal lagoons and lakes and the woodlands. This is Brahim, uh, my uh, Moroccan guide and tour operator, uh, lovely guy, and um, he started off. He was a Lived, uh, grew up in a nomad family in the Sahara and uh, got a job as a camel jockey at one of the tourist hotels in the Marzuga Dunes. And um, two uh, European birders came down and they hired him as a driver to take him around the area. And uh, they started, he started learning the birds from them. And they said, boy, you're, you're learning the birds pretty quickly. You should, you should, you could become a bird guide. And he never even thought of that. So he uh, then started focusing on birds and learning. I mean, he's 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 excellent and he's really good at uh, logistics and um, just a wonderful human being. And so I um, use him for all my tours down there. And here we're going out on this big, huge uh, coastal lagoon, which is famous for the marsh, African marsh owl. It's the only spot where the marsh owl nests north of the Sahara. It's a sub-Saharan species. And um, the Sahara wasn't always there. It wasn't always along the coast um, in the old, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And so you have these relictual populations of several species that are found north of the Sahara, just these remnant populations that didn't die out, that persisted. And this is one of them. Um, the lagoon is really great for shorebirds, lots of you know, springtime, you get these Eurasian shorebirds coming into breeding plumage, and this is a bar-tailed godwit, um, common red shank, curlew sandpiper, Eurasian curlew, and your Eur Eurasian oyster catchers. And Eurasian oyster catchers aren't like our black oyster catchers. They're actually in um, sandy beaches and mudflats, and they'll go in rocky areas like our black oyster catchers. And um, Montague's Harrier is the migrant coming over. See all those, those stripes on the underwing that um, separates it from the Northern Harrier. And um, this lagoon is famous for the, it's the last place where Slenderberg Bill Curlew was found in, I think in 1993 or 1994, the last one, and is now considered extinct. And we went to the little sandbar where the last one was seen, but we were there decades too late, unfortunately. Um, really fancy bird. Um, it's pretty common in these areas is the Eurasian spoonbill. They're different from our spoonbills in being uh, white with uh, 
kind of that yellowish uh, chest and throat and the yellow tip to the bill and that nice shaggy crest. Um, little turns, which are basically the equivalent to our, our uh, least turns found along the beaches. And they have lots of interesting gulls there. Um, this is a slender bill gull. None of the gulls nest in the area, but they're, um, they're winter. Um, they, a lot of them nest in, um, in the Mediterranean area. And this is one of the Mediterranean breeders, slender build. There's also Eurasian stone curlew, which is in the thick knee family. Uh, pretty fancy bird. There's another, another harrier, the Western marsh harrier. This is the female. And they look very similar to the golden eagles. They have a very similar pattern the gold on the head and on the nape. And of course there are ducks. This is a white-headed duck. It's a pretty fancy bird. It's related to ruddy duck, but it's much bigger with a much big, bigger bill. Um, pretty fancy looking thing. And um, red-crested potchard, male and female. And even the coots are different, red knob coot babies, little red knobs on the top of the head. And marble ducks. Little grebe. And great crescent grebe. And common potcher, these are wintering birds from the north. The others that I showed earlier were resident birds. They're all year round. There's the female common potchard. And in the coastal lagoons, there's some, there's some forest. And here's a flock of uh, migrant black kites that are resting um, during their migration. And they come from sub-Saharan Africa and they go all the way up into, through, into Europe. And sometimes you can see uh, flocks of, of you know, 100 or so, these black kites. And they're pretty big. They're, they really remind me of osprey in terms of their size and their wing shape. Here's another of the fancy gulls, the Adwin's gull, which really reminds me ecologically of a, a Herman's gull, very similar size and shape. And they like the beaches and they're also similar in that they have the black legs as adults. And then on the left is the a yellow-legged gull, uh, which is about a herring gull size, and on the right is the uh, lesser black bat gull. They're both pretty common here in the, in the region. And of course, there are migrants coming through. We go in the springtime the, during the migration season, and European bee eaters. Sometimes we'll see them along the co along the coast, and short-toed snake eagle. And um, from the coastal area in the north, we drop um, a little bit south to the Middle Atlas Mountains, where the Atlas flycatcher is endemic to this these forests here. They're not in the High Atlas Mountains, but they're in the Middle Atlas Mountains. So a very, very small population. They winter in the Sub-Saharan um, Africa, um, probably northern Ghana. There's not much known about their wintering range. Of course, they have a really small population, tiny geographic area where they nest. A pretty fancy bird. And in these forests, you can also see the Barbary ape. And there's an adult, and here's a juvenile. And Barbary apes are unrelated to any of the sub Saharan apes. They're actually um, related to the macaques of Asia. So um, the macaques are found from China, uh, Japan, the famous snow monkeys in Japan. That's a macaque. They're, they're very large, almost baboon uh, size uh, apes. And uh, they're found all through Asia and they used to occur probably throughout the Mediterranean. And um, their population on Gibraltar and then in this area of Morocco. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty cool animal and it's, uh, Actually, that the drops you see in the next to it are it's, it's snow. We actually had snow that day, um, so it's pretty cold. 
And then these beautiful forests in the middle of the mountains, these huge oak trees and huge uh, cedars, um, European cedars. It's like a old growth primeval um, Southern uh, European forest. And uh, so we have some of the European birds uh, nesting here. So it's great, great place to work on your African list, continent list, getting these European species that are resident. This is a nuthatch. Eurasian jay you know, in the snow <laughs> and melodious warbler. And this is the one lark that's found in the forest. It's a woodlark. They're in the trees and uh, it's found in the woods. And short toed tree creeper, which is very similar to our brown creeper. And a little bit above um, the Middle Atlas Mountains, you get into sort of this. Um, a little high area of uh, grassland and it's a ruddy shell duck and in the snow and snow is falling and then from there we we drop down into the high desert you can see the mountains in the background and um we go into the todra gorge this famous gorge it's just gorge, beautiful uh really steep and there's some special birds there including wild rock pigeons and here's some more desert area you see how how dry it is arid these are very very short shrubs only a few inches tall and these cliffs are uh, pretty good for um some special species which i'll show you in a minute and the zyta plains which is um special for one species of bird, which I'll show you. And um, so in these areas, you get some, a few spots where you can get the African scrub warbler, which for a while was thought to be in its own family. Um, uh, one in the Middle East and one in, the, in, the, in Africa, uh, the scrub warblers were thought to be in another family. But since uh, a few years ago, they were lumped in with the prinias, you know, considered to be a prinia. And um, here's a desert lark, and they tend to be in the rocky areas, you know, along the cliffs and boulders and stuff. And here's that special bird that's in the Zyta Plains, the DuPont's lark. And that's really hard to get photos, really hard to get close to them, and really hard to find. Um, but they're in these scrubby areas. And this is one of the few places on the planet where you can actually see this species. They're also in um, southern um, Spain, but they're very, very difficult to see there as well. And if you, you find a few little spots where there's a, little, a few little trees, tamarisk trees, and you get the Saharan olivaceous warbler. And also when you're looking for the DuPont's lark, there's a lesser short-toed lark, which has now been uh, changed to actually, um, to change that, whoops to Mediterranean short toe lark. It was just changed this year. I forgot to change my um, my label here, but it's a Mediterranean short toe lark, which is split from the short toe lark in the Middle East and in uh, Asia. And here's a greater short toe lark, lacking much streaking underneath. And uh, when you get tired of larks, you can look at the raptors, lesser kestrel, it really it's very similar to our American kestrel. They have the kind of that blue gray tail, the black tip. And they're very different looking uh, head and crest. And long-legged buzzard, which look very, very similar to um, our Frugian's hawks. And here's another one of the crested larks. This is a Maghreb lark, much bigger build than the crested lark that I showed you earlier. And this is found in this uh, more of the arid areas in the Sahara, especially around palm uh, oases and um, uh, especially uh, date palms, orchards, and um, get the Maghreb lark. And the special Maghreb weed ear, which is a bird that a lot of people come here to see. It's one of the big target birds for people. Um, and we have the red rump weed ear. And the northern weed ear, it's a, a migrant through the area. They nest up in um, 
and through uh, Asia, I mean, um, Northern Europe. And we get a few migrants such as Pied Flycatcher. Um, coming out of the Atlas Mountains into the desert are these rivers. And so there's some riparian areas right at the base of some of these canyons. And you tend to get Pied Flycatcher and Nightingale, the famous Nightingale. They love to sing at night, but they also sing during the day. And it's a thrush. It's actually related to um, our, our um, permit thrush. And the spotted flycatcher. And a bird very similar to the horn lark, but different is the Temex lark, which is a separate species. Very looks very similar to a horn lark, but they're only found in these low desert areas and these height in the, in the Zyda Plains and some of the Sahara. And here's the, the third of the larks with a crest. This is the Thecla lark, which is a medium sized bill, a little bit grayer. And these are found in the desert areas in the rocky desert. A very special bird that a lot of people come to see is the thick bill lark. You can see where it gets its name. It looks very similar to a, um, a lark bunting, especially a male um, in winter plumage. Um, very si similar size and shape. Um, and it's a very difficult bird to locate sometimes. They're kind of nomadic. They're not always in the same place every year. And they're widely distributed through this endless desert. So you have to look, look hard for them. And in the, sort of the scrubby areas along the hills, you get another endemic bird, the Tristam's warbler. It's a very fancy bird a lot of people come to see, especially Europeans. And this is sort of the habitat where you find them. See the Atlas Mountains in the background, in the scrubby area. Also, when you get around cliff areas, you get the European Craig Martin, which is um, a, a swallow. And uh, trumpeter finches. There are sand grouse in, this, in these high plains. It's the pintailed sand grouse, which are not grouse at all, and they're kind of really they're they're in their own family, but they're closely aligned with uh, doves. And in these rocky uh, cliff areas, you get the special pharaoh eagle owl, which is about the size of a great horned owl, and the coloration just perfectly matches the reddish um, rocks. And um, we, we go to um, uh, several nest sites for these birds. Uh, pretty neat. From the high desert, we drop into the Saharan, and this is the famous Merzuga Dunes, where um, name any movie that takes place in the Middle East that has sand dunes, and it was filmed here. Uh, there's a city uh, a few hours away called Warzazak, and it's just, just south of the High Atlas Mountains. And not far from Marrakesh, and uh, it's uh, the Hollywood of Africa. And there's a lot of big studios there. Um, movies have been filmed out of the studios and out in this area since the 1920s. Um, so Lawrence of Arabia, all those old old movies from the 20s and 30s that take place were here. Um, the Mummy, um, anything, all the new movies. They're all they're all uh, from this area. So it's pretty neat. And this is our hotel. This is sort of the traditional architecture. And you go in through that gate and you get into this compound with a swimming pool and fountains and trees. Very nice. And this is a town, it's the typical towns, the architecture and all the date palms are all in these canyons where there's um where there's water. And then this is on the other side of the Marizuga Dunes in this really dry desert, no vegetation at all. And that's Algeria in the background, the hills. And then this is the uh, typical palm riparian. Um, palm trees are really, well, not too many other trees are um, in this 
in these riparian areas at all. Uh, actually, there are some others, but I'll show you later. But here I am ready for the Sahara. This is the, um, um, I can't remember the name of the tribe, Tuareg, Tuareg, uh, blue. Um, that's what their traditional outfit. Here's the dunes again. And we go, um, take four-wheel drives, we go around the dunes um, to some areas where you can get the African desert warbler, which is beautiful, beautiful little birds, very ivory color, um, almost translucent. And um, the common larks here, the bar-tail lark, very, very um, cryptic, kind of looks, looks, just looks like sand. And uh, around the date palms, we get special birds like the blue cheek bee eater, which is a uh, winters in sub-Saharan Africa and um, migrates north into um, Northwest Africa. Um, they also breed in sub-Saharan Africa as well, uh, but they don't get into Europe. Uh, it's a pretty cool bird. And brown neck raven, you can see the brown, whole brown head on this bird. This is a desert species. And there's a little strip there where uh, Brahim had paid. There's a, a guy who has a well and a, a little plot that he grows, um, has a little agricultural plot. And Brahim uh, paid him money to make a little uh, hole in the in the um, the water the water line, so you can have a little wet little spot in the middle of the stony desert that attracts sand grouse. And so we go there around eight in the morning and sit in the cars and the sand grouse all come in and you can get to photograph them and get excellent views um, at these birds. This is a male on the left and a female on the right. And here's the crown sand grouse. Also area for desert sparrow, which is related to the house sparrow, but really beautiful little bird. These are juveniles begging from the male, adult male. Here's an adult male. There's also desert weed ears out here. Another one. And Egyptian night jars. Um, I'm not sure if I, oh yeah, I do have a Egyptian night jar. And Brahim has a nomad, uh, a friend who lives in this one area. And um, he pays him to go out the day before uh, we arrive. He goes out and listens for the night jars at night, tracks them down, finds out where they are, stays there till dawn to find out where they're going to roost for the day. And then, uh, so he takes us right to the spot. Otherwise, there's no way you can ever find these birds on your own. So um, it's pretty, pretty cool situation. And he's got his eyes closed, but um, very fancy bird. And a chatter, which is a babbler species. And uh, this is the only species north of um, the Sahara in Western Af uh, North Africa, the Rufus chatter, they're found in these areas. And another really fancy, probably the fanciest lark is a greater hoopoe lark. They have a long bill, not quite as curved as a, as a hoopoe, uh, but pretty big. And they do the aerial displays and that's with their wings open black and white wing stripes, pretty fancy bird. And uh, the other sand grouse that we get at that spot is the spotted sand grouse, male, uh, male on the right, female on the left. And here we are. Another wheat ear in the area is the white crown, very similar to the black wheat ear, but they have a white crown and the glossy black, not that dull black that I showed you earlier. And occasionally we'll see black bellied sand grouse as well. Very special bird um, in the area is the cream colored courser. And coursers are, um, there's one species in India and all the other species are sub-Saharan, uh, except for this one gets north of the Sahara, the cream colored. If you go to my website, um, I've got uh, more recent photos of cream colored and other species, and you'll you'll get you'll see much better photos of some of these birds as well. From the Sahara, we drive to um, the west to 
towards the south coast. And there's the High Atlas Mountains in the background, and we're in the Anti Atlas Mountains, which is um, completely arid because the High Atlas Mountains forms a rain shadow. So almost nothing, no, almost no precipitation in this area. And here you can see remnants of uh, acacia thorn forest that um, um, I think 800 or 1,000 years ago, it was much wetter. There was almost a, it was a savanna, grassland savanna. And there were rhinos and um, several, several other animals. I think there might've been giraffes, I'm not sure. But there are different antelope species. I know there were rhinos um, and different things, but um, it uh, dried out over the last thousand years. And so all those animals disappeared. And probably a lot of them were killed off because the Romans had a big, um, Morocco is part of a big Roman colony. And the Romans would come and get these animals to bring to the Colosseums for um, their fights and their zoos and whatever they had in, your, in, in the big cities. Here it is again. We stop here in this little town for, for lunch. And this is the town where um, saffron was uh, discovered. And saffron is the um, um, parts of the flower of the, of the composite, um, um, like a daisy type flower. And um, we can go to this, the, this town, you can buy um, lots of saffron for um, very inexpensive compared to the United States. Um, so you can bulk up on it and bring it home and give it to as gifts. Um, they use saffron a lot in their, in their uh, cooking in Morocco. And you can also put it in your in tea and it, it uh, gives you, um, it's really nice, uh, um, gives you a nice feeling um, having the saffron in your tea, um, very relaxing. And as we head um, further towards the coast, it gets wetter and wetter, and we get into all the argon tree savannas. And argon tree savannas are very similar to um, like an oak savanna that we have in California. Uh, but the argon trees have these nuts that are um, processed, um, the oil is processed into argon oil. And if you notice, you go to uh, look at perfumes or soaps, or shampoos, there's a lot of argon oil now um, in a lot of these products. And um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing, uh, argon. You go to a, a little argon store that they show the traditional way of uh, processing argon uh, nuts and you can buy all kinds of argon products. Um, we also go buy a rose petal, um, a little factory where they, get, uh, make rose water and rose oil, um, you can buy all sorts of products, um, soaps with rose, rose oil soap, et cetera. It's pretty neat. Um, we finally get to the coastal prairie. Um, usually these are covered with wildflowers in March and then they, by May, there, there are only a few flowers left, uh, but pretty extensive area. And it's the coastal prairie here. It's a little bit drier since so it's taken in, in May. Uh, but it's very, very famous for the Northern Bald Ibis. And this is a restaurant named after it. Um, and this is this town where we stay in, right on the coast. And you can see the flowers. And this is the bird we're looking for, the Northern Bald Ibis. There is a flock in this area and then a little bit north, about two hours north along the coast. The only two remaining wild flocks on the planet. Uh, this species used to be widespread from the Middle East um, and through the Alps and the Pyrenees, all through um, Spain and Portugal, and then down into Northern Africa. Um, they have been uh, relocated, populations have been relocated to Spain to try to um, get a, a colony established in Spain and also in Syria. Uh, Num quite, a, quite a while ago, but um, people think they might have been all killed during this, the Syrian war, the civil war. Um, so this is pretty much the, the place where you go to see this species. Um, and the, there's a national park, all those dunes area that I showed you is a national park uh, to preserve the habitat for the northern bald ibis. And here's the Moroccan cormorant, very similar to the great cormorant. Some people consider it a subspecies, but so all that white on the, on the neck and the head. 
we get a few European birds. There, there's um, little estuaries, little creeks um, with um, agriculture. Uh, the agriculture is mostly, um, it's very, um, the, the water is very uh, saline, so they can only grow um, alfalfa and some hay for, uh, for their animals or goats and sheep. Um, but there's little bushes and vegetation there. And so you have European blackbird, common bulbul, which is uh, normally found in sub-Saharan Africa. There's a relictual population here. Common kestrel, a European kestrel. And there's along the river, we get common kingfisher. And in the fields, you get corn bunting. It looks very similar to a sparrow, like a vesper sparrow, that eye ring. And here's the stone curlew again. Because the eye color matches the flowers. And European stone chats are pretty common. And in migration, we get the Iberian chip chaff. And this is a species very similar to the common chip chaff, but it's only breeds in um, nor northern coast of Morocco and in um, Spain and Portugal. And the little owls. In fact, we have little owls in many different places in Morocco. And they're equivalent to um, our burrowing owl. And the white wagtail subspecies here is the Moroccan. And it's much different from the other um, the European subspecies. And they do have a special starling, the spotless starling which is found in um, Spain, Portugal, and Northern Africa. It's kind of that inky black without any spots or anything or any brown. It's kind of, it's a really pretty bird actually. And um, the Zuni cisticula, there's uh, most of the cisticulas, there's many, many different species of cisticulas in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then um, uh, this is the only, this is one species that gets north of, of the Sahara, and it goes all the way from Morocco to ch through China and actually into the Philippines. It's a really widespread species. They're in Southern Europe as well. Um, it's the Zitine cisticula. And this is actually a shrike, um, the black crowned chagra. And this is another relictual population of this species. It's mostly in Sub Saharan Africa. And there's one little population um, in this area of uh, Morocco, coastal Morocco. And it's a shrike. And it's a common swift, pretty, pretty common migrant coming through in the springtime. It's the Isabelline warbler. They nest in these, these areas, scrubby areas. And we can look out, out in the ocean and lo and behold, they're northern gannet. You never would think of a northern gannet in Africa, but they're pretty common along the coast, out in the ocean. Um, in fact, we could set up scopes from our hotel uh, balcony um, and look at gannets. And I actually saw, I've seen great skuas and um, quarry shearwater um, just from the, from the, the balcony. Um, these are Mediterranean gulls, another species that nests in the Mediterranean. If you winter this far south into Morocco on the coast. And then the Rufus bush robin, which is found in the, some of the Saharan o oases, especially the palm, date palm orchards, but also on the coastal dunes itself as well. And bush robins are mostly in the sub-Saharan Africa. There's many different species. <laughs> this is only when it gets this far north. And the Western Orphean Warbler with a black head and the, and the white eye ring. Sub-Saharan, uh, well, Western Subalpine Warbler is pretty common. Hybrid. And then we end it, we go back, um, drive back from the coast to Marrakesh. And this is the, the Grand Souk area, with, which is this, um, maze of markets and um, this is what it looks like they're all covered um, and uh, just really really fun to walk through here and buy all kinds of stuff 
uh, you could buy antiques, you could buy, you know, $3,000 silver, pure silver um, teapots to uh, uh, spices and um, tourist t-shirts um, and anything in between. So it's, it's a pretty amazing spot. And this is kind of the general, the Grand Plaza. And there's um, these, these little carts um, have uh, fruit drinks and they, they freshly squeeze fruits and you can just order any combination you want. It's pretty cheap and you get this big tall glass of, of uh, amazing uh, fruit juices. Um, and in the last trip, um, and this last March, I did a special trip. I did two tours of Morocco this, this last spring, but the first one, we went all the way down in this Western Sahara, way in the South, and we had to camp out in the middle of nowhere in this area. And uh, we saw, look for some pretty special animals. And here, the little tents. And uh, we had these amazing guys um, that were cooks. They did everything. They, they drove, the drivers, they set the camps, and they cooked these amazing meals, uh, hot meals out in the middle of nowhere. And this is one of the birds we look for. It's a Sudan golden sparrow and the Dunn's lark and your Faroe eagle owl. And here is some tea, famous tea. Everywhere you go, there's Moroccan tea. A lot of it's mint tea. And um, here's some of us on the gang on top of one of the dunes at sunset and with uh, Brahim. And uh, that's all I have to say. Um, any questions? Oh, and be sure to go to my website, sterlingbirds.smugmug.com and click on the Moroccan photo gallery. And I got a lot more photos there. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you, John. So I'm gonna go ahead and hop into the chat box here to see if anyone has already um, entered, entered any questions. If any of you have any questions that you have not yet entered into the chat box, feel free to go ahead and do so now. We'll give it a few moments here to see if anything pops up. Let me see. Um, the only thing that I'm seeing here in the chat box as of right now is the link to Fresno Audubon membership um, that Nancy sent earlier. So I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. So we will give it a moment and see. Um, oh, here we go. So uh, Gary's question to everyone is, or to you is, uh, let me read that again. What is your absolute favorite bird from Morocco? <laughs> I like the I like the African blue tit a lot. Um, it's just just gorgeous bird, but there are so many there. Um, you know that the northern bald ibis is pretty special. I do like the the valence green woodpecker um, and the African crimson wing finch. Um, sand grouse are spectacular. I, I have this sadistic love for larks because they're difficult to identify. So I, I like the larks in general as well, um, and the weed ears. And I, but you know, I push comes to shut. And of course, the Egyptian nightjar, um, Pharaoh eagle owl. But the African blue tit. Um, every time I see it, I just I just smile. Okay, nice. Now, uh, John's question is, what camera gear, sorry, what camera gear slash lens are you using? Okay, I have it right here, just a second, I'll bring it out. So a lot of those photos that I showed you were from previous trips, not the last, not this last spring trip. So I use different, different camera gear than I'm using now. But now I use the, uh, I use Nikon, I switched from Canon to Nikon, um, and I use the 850D uh, body. The lens is a 500 prime lens, the PF um, uh, F 5.6. It's about $3,600, something like that. And it's fairly light for the size and weight, and I mean, for the size and length. And then I have a 1.4 extender, which brings it up to a 740 millimeter um, lens and the the uh, megapixels the 
is for the the size of the file it's it's 48 megapixels um, for the for the photos so you can crop in really well without losing a lot of detail and it's a full frame camera um, so that's that's what I'm using now it's it's a uh, lighter than the equivalent uh, equipment from a Canon and some of the other gear but um, I did have a uh, mirrorless I mean a mirrorless um, camera um, for a while the uh, Olympus it was M M1 with their 300 millimeter pro lens and their uh, doubler I like that a lot it's very light very compact but I had a hard time getting flight photos with it I couldn't get focusing so I switched over the, the Nikon, that's, that's what I'm using. Okay, so uh, we got several questions that have come in now. So our next one is from Marjorie, uh, is when is your next tour and how many people are usually on your tour? Um, I bring six to eight people and I usually have a guest leader. Uh, my next tour to Morocco is gonna be 2024. It probably might be my final one. My guest leader is um, Herbert Beru Hwanga from, he's a, the top uh, guide uh, from Uganda. He's the president of the Guide Association and formed the, the uh, started the women's uh, guide organization as well. Um, so he's uh, very influential in um, tourism in Uganda. And he had never been to Morocco and uh, he was, marveling at my photos. So I told him, I'll bring you for free and you can come as my guest. So um, he's pretty happy about that. So he'll he'll be on the 2024 trip. And uh, it's probably going to be my last one. I, you know, I can't guarantee I'll do it again. Um, I got, you know, several people interested already and I'll take um, up to eight people. And we're going to actually add uh, we're adding, adding extra days. We're going to add um, two extra days. Uh, we're going to spend one day in the royal city of Fez, uh, which is a famous royal city and lots to see there, cultural activities, etc. And then um, again, the day before the tour starts, I, have, I suggest people come in a day early just to get over jet lag. And that's when we do the, Mar the Marrakesh cultural tour and and all that. Um, so it'll be uh, mid-April and um, just finalizing the itinerary now. So if you get on my, if you go to uh, get, send me an email to jsterling at wavecable.com, I will uh, put you on my email list and I'll let you know of my tours. Um, I have a bunch of tours for next year, but they're all, they fill up really quickly and they're all full. They fill, I, I usually fill tours within two or three days. So you have to act, 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 you know, act fast if you if you hear about it. Um, but I am gonna do a, I do, I am gonna do a advertise a Patagonia tour for next November, which is their springtime. So we'll cross over from the Atlantic coast of Argentina, cross Patagonia to central Chile and includes a boat trip out in the ocean in the Atlantic and a boat trip out in the ocean in the Pacific off Chile. And that'll be in November. So you have to get on my meet, email list um, to hear about that. And they'll, um, 2024, I'll have a Northern Argentina, uh, no, Northern Peru trip and a Sri Lanka tour and then probably a couple of Columbia tours. But for next year, I've got two Uganda tours that are filled up in two days. And I had two U Columbia tours that filled up really quickly and a Jamaica tour that filled up really quickly. Uh, that's all I'm planning uh, for that. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, John. Uh, sure. So uh, we got uh, several more questions and comments here. Uh, the next one is uh, why Morocco versus other areas of Africa, which others flock to? Um, it's the only place where I would recommend going in Northern Africa. Um, Egypt is good because you have uh, all the cultural stuff there, but the, um, the birding is not nearly as, as good um, in Egypt. Um, uh, the other countries are problematic uh, for tourism. Uh, Morocco is um, 
very safe country. It's uh, tourism is a major, a major industry. And so it's, uh, and also had, it's got the, probably the biggest bird list and the biggest diversity of habitats. So it is the ideal place to go. Um, there's, there's no reason to go anywhere else. Um, in fact, if you go to Algeria, um, binoculars are illegal because it's considered a, a, a war equipment, military equipment. Um, so Morocco is a place to go. Um, thank you. Uh, so our next question is, uh, it says, not a bird question, but I've been told that sand cats are the ancestors of our modern house cats. Do they look like the cats that we know today? No, they're very, very different. If you Google it, they're very, they're very small. They have a huge head, they're kind of a flat head. Um, they're tiny little things. They're really different. The um, house cat, there's a European wild cat and then the African wild cat. And they're very, very, they look very similar and they look like a tabby cat. Like our, uh, you know, and I think those are, that's where our, our cats, domesticated cats came from. But the sand cat's very different, very, very different. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, our next, um, next in the chat here, this is not a question, but rather a, um, a compliment. Uh, Nancy Griesher says, really appreciate your sharing of the, of the ecology of each bird group. Wonderful presentation, thank you. Um, next is from Chris Hyatt. This says, have you had any close calls crime-wise? Also, I heard the second woman ever to see 200 species in each California county is about to happen. Could you speak about status of the county listers group? <laughs> okay. Um, no, I've never had any problems in Morocco. Um, there's Morocco is is the government is run by king, and the king really uh, um, doesn't the government doesn't appreciate crime, and they don't appreciate um, uh, Islamic extremists like Al Qaeda. Um, they're pretty much shut down pretty quickly. Um, so it's, a uh, it's pretty safe. They, they, you know, since tourism is a major, major industry along with agriculture, um, they do not want any, uh, a, a, to have a bad reputation to scare tourists away. So it's, it's, I, I've never had a problem, uh, with the county listers. Um, yeah, Linda Pittman is real close, I think. She might be one county away, or she might have already gotten her last county over 200 species. And um, so that's it. I'm, we're I'm, the uh, the county lister website, which is on on my website. Uh, my website is being completely redone right now. So hopefully, in a few weeks, it'll be modernized and back up to speed. The only problem is that I had these color coded maps california maps the color codes for different counties showing um coded by how many species you know an individual has and the um the uh software company that um, made the software where i was able to create these no longer supported the software and i was able to use it carry on for a few more years until now it, it, it died and it's just software won't i can't use software anymore and i have not been able to find another a mapping software where I can replicate my maps. So that's the status. I'm trying to figure it out. That's it. Yeah. Well, thank you for again. The, and, um... for the, or for those that don't know, um, I keep track. Uh, I like to promote people um, birding every county in California, all 58 counties, because it's a good way to kind of explore new places and really get to know California and the California bird distribution. And so there's quite a few people who um, have joined this club and I keep a spreadsheet with everybody's totals. So that's the background. And Chris Hyatt's went on, on there too. So that's why he asked the question. Well, thank you, John, for elaborating on that. And we have uh, two, um, two more comments here. Uh, John says, thank you for the wonderful presentation and camera information. And Marjorie Powell says, thank you for a fascinating presentation. So that's all that we have in the chat box for now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of um, 
wind things down. If anyone wants to add, oh, sorry, Iris says, thank you for the lovely talk. So if anyone wants to add any questions or comments, feel free to do so now. In the meantime, I'm gonna kind of, um, yeah, just wind things down here. So, yeah, like I said, feel free to add, ask last minute questions or comments, but yeah, thank you again, John, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you for everyone who attended. We really, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of to remind everybody, we have relaunched our YouTube channel. So if you want to review or, uh, this presentation or um, know anyone who missed it and would like to view the presentation, we'll have this presentation uploaded uh, sometime in the next few days. Um, our YouTube channel uh, is a great place to also view other uh, general, me general meeting presentations from the past several months. So check that out if you haven't already. Also, we're, we are on social media. So if you're not already following us on Facebook or Instagram, uh, feel free to go ahead and do so. And we hope that you'll join us for next month's uh, general meeting, which is scheduled for October 11th. And um, Larry Parmenter will be talking to us about how birds taught humanity how to fly. So that should be a very interesting topic. Stay tuned for an announcement and leaks, I'm sorry, links to registration for that event. And I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. So with that, um, thank you again, John, and um, have a great remainder of your week, everyone, and stay safe out there. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to talk. I enjoyed it.